communities. And so I like the way you started this earlier, which is about finding the balance. The reality is some really bad things happened in our history, and some of them continue today. However, we have to do, we have to, we have to do what my parents did, which is to tell those stories, but not only those stories. And I think my generation failed in part because it was ashamed of those stories. And so it stopped talking about, you know, J Judd Johnson, he, he, didn't just, he didn't just have knockout power in both hands. He had one of the first three patents for, a, uh, what was it, a, a, what we would call today a screwdriver, okay? Well, I think what's necessary then is, is to teach our young people the whole story. Talk to them about George Washington Carver, Booker T. Washington, some of the people that don't make it in the February stuff. But then also challenge them. Challenge them. I challenge every young person that comes into the museum with a simple challenge. And that is this, make something. Tell a new story. Christopher Bing, the, the illustrator, talented illustrator, we were debating one time because he wanted to clean up Little Black Sambo and he redrew the pictures and changed some of the language because for him, it was a nostalgic reminder of good times with his father. And I was trying to explain to him that for many African Americans, it, that's not what it represents. It represents something bad. And so I challenged him to use his incredible mind to tell a new story. Yeah. So for our young people, we owe them the truth, but we also owe them to inspire them and to challenge them and to say to them what my parents said to me, which is, up until six years ago, you couldn't go in that library, and one day soon, you'll be director of that library if you want to be. <laughs> yeah. we'll, uh, we'll start to make our way through the questions that we've received and just sort of give me the high sign there if it's something that you feel that you want to weigh in on. If it's not particularly directed at you, Barbara McQuaid, this one is directed at you. Uh, uh, referring to the Department of Justice, uh, yes, it's great going after hate crime, but how, uh, what about uh, violations of civil rights such as selective prosecutions and illegal wiretaps? This is a question I know that you face a lot. Uh, absolutely. You know, I think sort of uh, making the criminal justice system equal to all and an equal playing field is a really important challenge. And um, this Justice Department under President Obama has taken that on and tried to look at some of those institutional things that have a disparate impact on different communities. I mean, you, know, you look at the statistics and the numbers of African Americans in prisons is astronomically high uh, compared to the number of African Americans in college. Uh, you know, why is that? And trying to look at that and are we doing things uh, s systematically across uh, the criminal justice system that's causing that. Um, the, the, disparate sentences for powder cocaine versus crack cocaine. Mm -hmm. Previously, mm -hmm. it was a 100 to 1 ratio uh, of difference. Uh, we've made some strides, but we're not all the way there yet. It's, it's come way down, but it's still 18 to 1. Yeah. So working on some of those kinds of issues, but, but certainly that's an important thing so that all members of our community have trust uh, in the Justice Department and in our criminal justice system is a very important thing. Attorney General Eric Holder has said, my work is not done until I can go down every street in America and salute all the people who are sitting on the front porch and the people on the front porch salute back. Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> Congressman Conyers, you want to weigh in on this with your seat on the Judiciary Committee? Well, um, yes, because uh, Many of the policies, including the ones that was mentioned in the question, uh, get formed uh, first by the Department of Justice itself, which sets the policy for the U.S. attorneys in the districts across the country. And that policy is made in coordination with the Judiciary Committee. And it just so happens that uh, Eric Holder is coming before my committee next week. And so I wanted to make this proposal, if I could, Mr. Moderator. Uh, the Department of Justice, I, I wouldn't say right, but this would be a great thing, Reverend Anthony, for many of these young people here in the Department of Justice, Washington, D.C. And, uh, and we need to
to, to be in contact with him directly. I, I get the opportunity quite frequently. And while I'm at it, I ought to add that also next week I will be meeting in 16, at 1600 Pennsylvania with the President of the United States. And that comes from the great support I've enjoyed uh, in my district over these numbers of years. Uh, but I would like to be able to take to President Barack Obama any of the comments, not only of people that are here today and will be with us tomorrow, but anywhere in the, in the 14th Congressional District, I want to take those to him and, and give them to him directly for his staff to understand what we're thinking and, and uh, working toward in terms of making uh, this a better country. Uh, the last thing is I would like everybody that agrees with me to urge the President of the United States to come back to Detroit, Michigan, where he has not been in a long time. I can't imagine there's a metropolitan area that's been more affected by his policy, the policies of his administration. A uh, question for Nicole Fox. The term five civilized tribes is used in many history books. Does the Native American community find this offensive? Have there been efforts to eliminate its use, five civilized tribes? Okay, so the five civilized tribes refer to um, Native people um, originally from the, the southeastern United States. Um, and I'm, I'm Cherokee. Um, Cherokees are one of the five civilized tribes. Um, and what that refers to is um, initially with uh, European settlement in, in the United States, um, Cherokee people um, took on a lot of European um, traditions and customs, um, including um, European style of clothing, um, adopting Christianity, um, uh, a written language, and uh, constitution. Um, so on, on the surface, um, the, the Cherokee uh, nation um, would look very similar to uh, a European settlement during that time. Um, so as far as um, if if communities find that offensive, I, I really can't speak for everybody. Um, I personally, I know what that that refers to, and um, you know, I, I think that that the Cherokee um, Nation before European uh, traditions was <coughs> very much civilized. So I don't I don't really see um, why it wasn't civilized before, and now it's called civilized. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Um, Great. Okay. Uh, Dawood, I, I, there's a question. I, it's a little complicated. I'm going to try and uh, sort of articulate what I think is the main issue here. And that is with uh, bringing uh, groups into this country and having them part of the American fabric, what do we do if we feel like the um, uh, like there's a collision of cultures, and in this ter in this case, uh, that Islam doesn't necessarily feel as friendly to women and women's rights as uh, most. I, I guess the idea here is most Americans uh, their same understanding of women's rights. Okay, there's two things in that question. One is a misconception. Uh, I think the largest demographic. American Muslims are African Americans. We make up about 38 percent, and there have been Muslims here in America since the first slave ships came here. So we're not a new phenomenon here in America. Now, saying that we have Islam as a religion, and then we have culture, and different cultures and how they deal with women varies. Like, for instance, a lot of West Africans who are moving into metropolitan Detroit, you know, six miles, seven miles around Lasser, there's a total different social dynamic that you would see with Senegalese or, or Muslims from the Ivory Coast than you would see with women from Afghanistan. Uh, I think there's a bigger problem, a worldwide problem, in the world in terms of 
women not being totally liberated anywhere. To, to this day in this country, <laughs> a woman in the United States of America on average with the same educational background as a man is not making the same wage as a male. This is still going on in America. So I would say that in terms of Islam and women's, uh, women's liberation, let's not confuse culture with religion. Another point, the three most populous Muslim countries in the world have had female heads of state. We haven't had one here yet. Indonesia is the world's largest population of Muslims. They had a female head of state recently, President Mavrawadi. Okay, then we had Pakistan, the late Benazir Bhutto at one time was the Prime Minister, and then Prime Minister Zia of Bangladesh, which is the third most populous Muslim majority country. So we, we, we've had female heads of state. We've had females who have been higher ups in, in as far as the military and uh, foreign ministry and et cetera. A lot of these things we see are, uh, are, are, stereot uh, are stereotypes, in, in my opinion. Do I sense frustration with your hands with that? <laughs> yeah, there, there, there's, a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of frustration. Um, you know, I, and I, I'm asked this question frequently. I shouldn't be frustrated, but I still am. I, even as far as our empirical data that we, that we have in the Muslim community and research, in terms of domestic violence, which is also a human problem, there are no empirical data to support that Muslim men abuse their spouses any more than Jewish men, Hindu men, Christian men, Buddhist men, etc. There's no such empirical data that even uh, exists, but there's a, there's a stereotype that somehow we Muslim men go upside our wives head more than Christian men or Jewish men. This is not the case. Uh, we have two pastors on the panel, so I'd like both of you, uh, a reverend and a pastor, to, to, to talk a, a little bit about your reflections on us all trying to coexist in different faiths in this world. We, there is so much, because we do have, um, uh, in most faiths, there is this I, central idea of acceptance and brotherhood and fellowship, and yet we also have uh, a sense of primacy in most faiths. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man enter the kingdom except through me. So how do we coalesce a world where we uh, have people who feel so strongly about their own beliefs and yet want to allow others that same freedom? Both of you, I, either which, whoever feels the spirit first, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, in, in any religion, in, including Christianity, it's not homogeneous. We try to and I think this is what you alluded to earlier, um, think everybody's the same. There are as many different perspectives within the Christian world of faith um, as, as any other. So I think it's important uh, to identify which particular tradition uh, you're looking at. Um, I have sort of led a campaign, um, and I work closely with um, all the religions, we built a new church, and I invited um, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, etc., to participate, and Native Americans, to participate in dedicate, dedicating uh, the church building in their own traditions. I'm of the belief, and I usually get beat over the head uh, for this all the time. We got a lot of beating over the head going on yeah. here. But I'm of the belief that, um, and I accept other religious experiences as being just as authentic as <laughs> And then secondly, I think what connects all religions and traditions together is predicated on the spirit. Um, all of the other things are important based on the traditions, etc. But in general, I think what connects all religions together, including Native American religions, um, African religions, etc., um, is in fact the spirit. And so there is a unity and a oneness there that allows us to come together and share experiences. I'm not interested in converting 
somebody that's a part of another religion and they practice that religion faithfully. I do not try to convert people from other religions. Reverend Perez, same thing. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think unfortunately, um, in some ways, um, I think our, uh, the general U.S. society um, has, has, is losing the ability to have civil discourse and, and has uh, become ill-practiced in um, genuine dialogue. Um, and so I think we're uh, in our, and young people in general are exposed to sort of a, a general culture um, that uh, where dialogue is sort of um, a, a, a shouting match uh, uh, where uh, we cannot at the same time hold deep personal convictions and treat other people whom we would spend a lifetime maybe uh, battling over those convictions um, with respect and dignity as, as a human person. So I think that's really, um, I think that's, that's a, a core practice that we need to, I think, engage in across communities and across faith traditions. Yeah. And I think um, that's sort of going back to your question about um, young people, I think that's a real, that's a real important a part of, of uh, being a young person. We can see similarities, especially the similarities across faith traditions of working for the cause of peace, justice, and liberation, yeah. um, and, and that cause of confronting um, uh, violence when it's used um, in the name of any religious tradition. Curtis, I'd be derelict if I didn't let you weigh in here because you come face to face I would think frequently with people say, look, it's nothing personal. It's my faith tells me that homosexuality is a sin. You must uh, come head to head with what people take from the Bible about your orientation all the time. Yes, we get that often. Um, many people who we serve, and, and myself, um, have been gay bashed. Um, gay bashing um, is uh, a way of uh, demeaning a person um, most often in public. Most folks who are uh, gay, lesbian, bi, trans folks who are Christian are often gay bashed by their spiritual leaders or their institutions or places of faith where they belong to. Yes, um, uh, I have been personally um, been gay bashed by uh, members of uh, the Muslim faith and the Christian faith. Um, uh, it's a place of fear for many of us. And so what happens, um, many people would um, place their um, personal view on um, uh, uh, gays and lesbians and therefore uh, uh, invoke harm. Um, people who come to us are people who have experienced some kind of hate. Um,